Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Kentucky Statewide Opioid Stewardship Program um, for our webinar today. I'm Stacey Allen, a pharmacy consultant for the team, and I'm joined by Emily Henderson, pharmacy consultant and um, project manager for Kentucky SOS. Today, we have the privilege of hosting Dr. Stephanie Abel, the Opioid Stewardship Program Coordinator at University of Kentucky Healthcare. Before I introduce Stephanie, um, I'll just take a few minutes to address some housekeeping items. Um, for attendance purposes, we ask that you please type in the chat box and um, type your name, let us know your profession and the hospital or clinic that you are with. The lines will be muted throughout the presentation, and we ask that you hold your questions until the end when you may unmute your line or um, enter your questions into the chat box. And Dr. Abel will be addressing attendees for feedback um, at one point throughout the presentation. Um, and we just ask that you please unmute your line and respond if you feel comfortable, or you can use this time for self-reflection. The webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to the Kentucky SOS website where it can be found under the events and education tab. The website address is www.kentuckysos.com and be sure and spell out the name Kentucky. And we'll be placing that web address in the chat for your convenience as well. Today's presentation, as I said, is by um, Dr. Stephanie Abel, and it is entitled Taming the Stigma Monster, Addressing the Impact of Longstanding Negative Perceptions of Opioid Use Disorder on Patient Care and Policy. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Abel. She is the, the Opioid Stewardship Coordinator for University of Kentucky Healthcare. Prior to that, she practiced as a pain management and palliative medicine clinical pharmacy specialist at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, James Cancer Hospital. She received her PharmD from Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, after which she completed a PGY-1 in pharmacy practice at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston and a PGY-2 in pain management and palliative care at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Stephanie has authored primary literature and book chapters on topics such as acute pain management in opioid tolerant patients. She has also been an invited speaker for many regional and national talks, as well as developed national and international education modules on topics such as opioid stewardship, pain management, palliative care, opioid use disorder, and medical marijuana to multidisciplinary audiences. Stephanie, thank you for being here today, and I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to, to spending the next hour with you. As part of my job, I get to help advocate and try to reduce the stigma surrounding opioid use disorder to help improve the outcomes of our patients. And my hope is that by the end of this presentation, you'll have some tangible steps that you can take to kind of help on that mission. Before we get started, I do have nothing to disclose and all images in this presentation are free for commercial use and no attribution required. As I mentioned, by the end of this presentation, my hope is that you will learn more about stigma and its impact within um, not only policy and kind of the structural systems, but also on ultimately the outcomes that that has on our patients. And then I want to provide you with some tangible things that you can do to actively start fighting this stigma even today. I've included a definitions and abbreviations slide just to make you aware of these so that you can reference them at your leisure if you need to. And I'd like to just kind of kick us off by asking a question and again, if you wanna pop in the chat, you're welcome to, or if you wanna just do this as a self-reflection, that's fine as well. But my question for you is, is this an opioid crisis or an opioid epidemic? Let's pause and think about the meanings here. The definition of epidemic is a widespread occurrence of an infectious disease in a community at a particular time. Opioid use disorder is not a contagious disease, 
and isolating and quarantining those who are impacted doesn't address the problem, but in fact exacerbates it. In contrast, the definition of crisis is a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger, which is really more appropriate for our situation. We will discuss how shifting our language is a huge part of moving the needle on stigma, and it needs to start with the title of the situation that we have on our hands. I love this quote by Jerome Adams, who was the US Surgeon General at the time. Folks often ask me what the biggest killer is out there. Is it obesity? Is it smoking? I think the biggest killer out there is stigma. Stigma keeps people in the shadows. Stigma keeps people from coming forward and asking for help. Stigma keeps families from admitting that there is a problem. So let's take a moment and actually dig into these terms a little bit. I know we've all heard them, but starting with stigma, this is the result of labeling and stereotyping. The label, or in this case, an addict, links the person to a set of undesirable characteristics that work to form the stereotype or beliefs held about a group of people with a substance use disorder. When people link a certain label to a person and then they believe the stereotype, they react negatively to the person, which in turn leads them to place more social distance from that person, engage in discriminatory ways, or support potentially harmful activities to the stereotyped individual. Explicit bias refers to the attitudes and beliefs that we have about a person or a group on a conscious level and much of the time, these biases and their expression arise as the direct result of a perceived threat. Implicit bias refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. And we all have them for a variety of reasons, just based on um, how we grew up, for example, the culture that we lived in, our communities, and things like that. There are two main factors that affect the burden of stigma that's placed on a particular disease or disorder. The first is the perceived control that a person has over the condition, and then next is the perceived fault in acquiring that condition. When we believe a person has acquired their illness through no fault of their own, or that they have little to no control over it, we typically attach no stigma to either the person or the illness. Consider to treat hard to treat cancers, for example. By contrast, Many people mistakenly believe that mental health conditions, including substance use disorders, are both within a person's control and partially their fault. For these reasons, they frequently attach more stigmas to them. The potential for stigma is greater still when someone is using an illegal substance, which carries the additional perception of criminality. And we're going to dig into the criminality aspect more in this presentation as well. So not surprisingly, substance use disorder is among the most stigmatized conditions in the United States and around the world. In fact, 75% of the public doesn't believe that substance use disorder is a medical illness. And about half of people believe that addiction is caused by bad character or lack of moral strength. Unfortunately, healthcare providers have similar levels of stigma and these negative attitudes contribute to disparities in treatment and outcomes. So this might present in a variety of ways in the healthcare setting, but generally speaking, we might, we might see this manifest in a couple of different ways. So people might believe that patients with OUD are um, being willfully, um, they're engaging in willful misconduct, right? So they're choosing to have opioid use disorder. They're choosing not to participate in their care. They also might have beliefs that they cannot be treated. They might think that these patients are potentially violent or manipulative or that they have a disruptive influence on a practice and therefore they don't want to really engage in treating OUD, for example. Since there are so many misconceptions surrounding addiction by the public and healthcare providers alike, I'd like to take a minute and review the pathophysiology. I promise we won't be having a pop quiz at the end of this presentation, but I do want to show you that truly addiction is a chronic disease and there's a lot of different things implicated but generally speaking, there are three main parts of the brain that are implicated and have kind of their role in the development and sustaining of addiction. So let's review those in more detail. The basal ganglia play an important role in the reward system circuit, which evaluates a stimulus and signals whether to approach or avoid that and assigns priority of one stimulus over another based on perceived survival benefit. Healthy examples include things like eating, socializing, and sex. 
Drugs significantly overactivate the circuit as seen in this diagram of the neurochemical release associated with eating on the left versus using cocaine on the right, which can be up to 10 times as much dopamine flooding the brain synapses initially, which produces that euphoria of the drug high. This hijacking of the reward system tricks the brain to prioritize seeking and using the drug above everything else. With repeated exposure, the circuit adapts to the presence of that drug, diminishing its sensitivity and eventually making it hard to feel pleasure from anything besides the drug itself. Next, we have the extended amygdala. This plays a role in stressful feelings like anxiety, irritability, and unease, which characterize the mental aspects of withdrawal. And this happens after the drug high fades and thus motivates the person to seek the drug again. This circuit becomes increasingly sensitive with increased drug use. Over time, a person with substance use disorder uses drugs to get temporary relief from this discomfort rather than to get high. And lastly, we have the prefrontal cortex. This powers the ability to think, plan, solve problems, make decisions, and exert self-control over our impulses. Shifting balance between all of these circuits make a person with a substance use disorder seek the drug compulsively with reduced impulse control. So let's incorporate what we've learned on the previous slides into the functional domains of substance use disorder, or what also could be called the addiction cycle. First, we have the binge and intoxication phase, which activates the basal ganglia and the reward system, with downstream effects changing the chemical balance affecting mood regulation from the extended amygdala and stress sensitivity and decision making from the prefrontal cortex. As neuroadaptation progresses, the driving motivation shifts from feeling euphoric to eventually feeling good while using, and then eventually people use to escape dysphoria. Then we have withdrawal and negative affect. Chronic drug use causes the reward system to try to correct the imbalance of reward neurochemicals by reducing the amount of dopamine that is naturally produced in the brain. This results in needing a greater amount of the drug to feel euphoria and other activities feel less rewarding. This shift in the reward threshold contributes to withdrawal and negative affect. As neuroadaptation progresses, the driving motivation shifts from feeling reduced energy when not using to then feeling reduced excitement, and lastly, to feeling depressed, an anxious, and restless. Next, we have the preoccupation and anticipation phase, which is related to condition reinforcement when the drug high becomes associated with certain cues and triggers, such as behaviors, people, and places that led them to getting high. Condition reinforcement strengthen each time a person engages in drug use and make it more difficult to stop themselves from using again via changes in the prefrontal cortex and the extended amygdala. As neuroadaptation progresses, the driving motivation shifts from looking forward to then desiring the drug to finally obsessing and planning to get the drug compulsively. Now let's talk about the different types of stigma and their associated harms. The first thing that I want you to be aware of is that stigma is directly correlated with dehumanization. And dehuman dehumanization is essentially the denial of human characteristics that we extend to ourselves. So we essentially deny others the capacity to feel and make decisions when we're engaging in stigma and subsequently dehumanization. Now history shows us that dehumanized groups are not seen as individuals but as members of a mindless cluster to whom we can direct our moral outrage and punishment. And this is pretty consistently true because our brains have their flaws. And another issue that occurs is when something terrible happens, we need some type of logical explanation and we need to close that loop. Our brains are not okay with gray areas. And so our brains make up stories and they reach for kind of the, the first thing or the easiest thing. And so what ends up happening is that within the opioid crisis, there is so much devastation that occurs from this and it's terrible and it hurts, right? And so people end up closing the loop by blaming the very individuals who are most impacted. In terms of dehumanization scales in the studies, people with addiction are often seen as the lowest of the low. They trigger reactions of disgust. And in various studies where they've evaluated fMRI imaging, They've shown that when a person with substance use disorder is shown to a participant in the study, it doesn't activate 
the parts of the brain that are normally recruited when viewing humans. Let's talk about the types of stigma. So first we have public stigma. This is driven by stereotypes about people with opioid use disorders, such as their perceived dangerousness or perhaps perceived moral failings, which translate into negative attitudes toward, toward people in general with opioid use disorders. Next, we have enacted stigma that describes the behavioral manifestations of public stigma, including discrimination and social distancing. Public and enacted stigma in turn lead to delivery of suboptimal care and undermine access to treatment and harm reduction services. Public stigma and enacted stigma become structural stigma when they become encoded in cultural norms, laws, and institutional policies. Collectively, these forms of stigma run at cross purposes to and reduce public support for public health oriented policies to address the opioid overdose crisis. When people with opioid use disorders internalize or anticipate this public stigma attached to their illness, maladaptive behaviors such as disengagement from care can lead to poor health outcomes. Each of these dimensions of stigma serve to reinforce each other, resulting in poor health outcomes, even as the epidemiology of opioid overdose mortality continues to change. These dimensions of stigma must be overcome to facilitate the requisite policy and programmatic changes that are needed to effectively address the opioid crisis. I'd like to take a minute to just walk through how when the rubber hits the road, this actually plays out because I think conceptually that can be difficult at times. So if we start with public stigma and every statement in this slide starts with a stereotype and prejudice, so this is more the thought and then we have the discrimination or the action that occurs because of it. So in the public view, the thought process might be that addicts are dangerous, they're immoral, they're criminal, and they're responsible for their disorder. And it shows up as employers shouldn't hire them, landlords shouldn't rent to them, healthcare providers shouldn't waste their time, just to name a few. Then we have the internalized stigma of a person who uses drugs. And so their thought process might be, because I use opioids, I'm dangerous, immoral, and ashamed. So they're internalizing what they're hearing externally. Their self-esteem and self-efficacy become very low. And so then how that essentially plays out is that they might think, you know, why try? Someone like me is not worthy or I'm unable to work. I can't live independently. I can't have good health. And I really don't have a good quality of life and I'm not able to do so. And so then this manifests as anticipated stigma in a person who uses drugs as they see the public disrespecting and treating them in, in this fashion. And so then they might say to themselves, I don't want this. I'm going to avoid this label by not seeking treatment. And essentially, by the time we get to a point where maybe they are able to engage in treatment, it's because things are forced and they are way further down the road than if we could have just addressed it early on. Another way to look at this is different levels of stigma, starting with macro. So this can present itself in terms of underfunded and fragmented care, barriers to applying evidence-based treatments, restrictive and coercive treatment policies, stigmatizing language in government and organizational policies, the media perpetuating stigma through false narratives and stigmatizing language, which we'll be discussing more in detail later. Then we have the meso level. This is where misunderstandings and false assumptions about patients and evidence-based treatment lead to poor patient care and outcomes, gross underutilization of harm reduction, exclusion of patients on MOUD from various 12-step programs, and a lack of support for public health versus punitive policies. Then on the micro, micro level, we have delays in help seeking, disconnection, increased morbidity and mortality, and there's few consumer advocates and stories of hope. There's a lot of illegal discrimination and challenges for patients on medication with opioid use disorder as well. Shatterproof identified nine commonly cited drivers of the opioid crisis. And maybe not surprisingly, seven of the nine are either partially or entirely driven by stigma. So let's re review those very briefly. First, we have overprescribing. Things like pharmaceutical company manipulation, pain is the fifth vital sign campaigns, and tying reimbursement to patient satisfaction with pain management kind of led to this. 
Then we had increased access to illicit opioids. So once we started to scale back and kind of went into this opiophobia era, the drug cartels from Mexico were more than happy to swoop in with illicit heroin when opioid prescribing shifted. And then later we had illicit fentanyl from China and eventually Me Mexico that infiltrated the supply because it's synthetic and cheap. And we know that about 80% of people who use illicit opioids use prescription opioids first. Then there's criminalization, and this has become a primary response, which we'll be discussing in more detail shortly. Next is isolation from society. So patients might not have um, engagement with their contacts, support systems, or the medical system. Then there's insufficient treatment capacity. So there's a shortage of addiction medicine specialists. There's a shortage of treatment facilities and people willing to prescribe buprenorphine, despite the fact that the X waiver was repealed last year. Then there's gaps in evidence-based treatments based on financial constraints and payment models, restricting treatment options and coordination of care. There are a lot of misunderstandings and lack of education for healthcare providers, stigma against MOUD, and even among treatment centers, this happens. Next, there's a lack of help seeking. So again, this anticipated stigma prevents individuals from seeking help. Think of it like this. If you know fewer than 20% of Americans want a friend, colleague, or neighbor who is addicted to opioids, it's going to be very difficult for that person to come forward and try to get the help that they need. So let's take a minute and just look at how we got here. Because if we don't know where we've come from, we don't know where we're going. Stigma and policy in the United States have been intertwined in a very tangled web since the beginning. It all started with the Harrison Narcotic Act of 1914 that required physicians and pharmacists who handled opium and cocaine to register with the U.S. Department of Treasury, pay a tax, and keep records of the narcotics that were dispensed. The Treasury Department interpreted the statute as a prohibition against physicians prescribing opioids to treat opioid addiction. In 1919, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the Treasury Department's interpretation. So you heard that correctly. The Treasury Department is the group of individuals in our federal government who determined this course of action, essentially, in the early 1900s. Subsequently, communities developed morphine dispensaries modeled on services for tuberculosis and sexually transmitted diseases then became aggressive federal prosecution that closed those dispensaries because they violated that prohibition. And lastly, arrest and incarceration replaced clinical services as the preferred intervention for drug use and addiction. Arguably, there is no more powerful and impactful social tool to create and project stigma on a structural level and its direct and indirect adverse consequences than through criminalizing a specific behavior and the people such criminalization identifies and targets. The criminal law, by definition, non-negotiably defines and enshrines most fundamental and shared social norms and values, and identifies actions and behaviors that violate and harm the social body of common rules, which are then prescribed punishment as the state's most powerful form of power. The criminal law, therefore, constitutes the authoritative state-sanctioned basis and seal of stigma in the context of a law-based society. Furthermore, criminalization serves as the ultimate legitimate reference or justification for certain behaviors or their actors to be differentiated, excluded, or penalized from many realms of life. There is extensive scientific evidence on how criminalization adversely affects substance use-related risks harms, and help seeking or service access. As public policy continues to pursue punishment and criminalization, a majority of states have enacted or are considering laws that result in murder charges, for example, for people with addiction who unknowingly provide a lethal dose resulting in a friend or acquaintance's death. These policies do not promote people seeking help for themselves or others. They, in fact, deter it. There is an excellent podcast that humanizes this issue and provides general perspective that I will provide details for those interested in listening at the end of this presentation. Now let's talk about some harsh truths about the current state of affairs that highlights a severe mismatch between our intention and outcomes. Almost half of people in the U.S. Bureau of Prisons population have been convicted of drug-related offenses. 
And the people that we really want to try to target with these policies are the big level su suppliers, right? So the people pulling the strings. And maybe not surprisingly, only about 11% of those folks account for this large number of people currently engaged in our prison system. 85% of those in prison either have an active substance use disorder, were incarcerated for a drug-related crime, or both, yet only 5% of people with opioid use disorder are receiving evidence-based treatment in prisons and jails. In the jail setting, people with substance use disorders are often cut off of treatment or substances abruptly, causing significant withdrawal. From 2000 to 2018, Jail deaths in people with substance use disorders increased 400% and often occurred within 24 hours of admission from complications related to withdrawal. For example, obtaining and using fentanyl to try to curb opioid withdrawal symptoms. And yes, fentanyl is widely available in prisons and jails. Or patients developing seizures from alcohol withdrawal, for example. Furthermore, prosecutions for fentanyl analog offenses increased 5,000% from 2015 to 2019. However, there has not been a corresponding decrease in fentanyl use or overdose deaths. In fact, these numbers actually drastically are continuing to rise. <clears throat> More than 30 states have new or pending legislation that imposes strict or harsh punishments for dealers and those with opioid use disorder. Let's take a peek at a few that are kind of pertinent as of right now. The first is the HALT Fentanyl Act. The class-wide scheduling that this bill would impose would exacerbate pretrial detention, mass incarceration, and racial disparities in the prison system doubling down on a fear-based enforcement first response to a public health challenge. Unfortunately, the House passed the bill in May. <clears throat> Alternatively, the Stop Fentanyl Overdoses Act was also introduced in May and has not gone any anywhere, but this bill would take some more public health evidence-based approach. And then lastly, we have Kentucky House Bill 5. This was reintroduced in January after not making it through the 2023 legislative session. And essentially, this would allow people to be charged with either, either mur murder or manslaughter if they administered or gave a dose to somebody who ended up overdosing. And it also would increase criminal pen penalties in general associated with fentanyl, again, exacerbating the problem with kind of the criminalization approach to treatment. <clears throat> so let's fast forward a little bit and determine after the Harrison Narcotic Act, kind of how we got where we are today. So decades later, in the 1960s, methadone treatment began emerging through research treatment centers. This was quietly tolerated despite prohibition on use of controlled substances for the treatment of opioid use disorder. In 1970, the FDA proposed new rules for the research treatment centers, including very strict requirements on entry into treatment, dosage, and duration. In 1972, FDA regulations removed methadone from general distribution and established a unique federal control system to limit the administration of methadone dispensing to a federally licensed opioid treatment programs, requiring federal registration for physicians involved in methadone dispensing. In 1974, the DEA was given authority over the storage and security of addiction treatment medications, and the physicians and OTPs were required to begin maintaining um, an annual DEA registration. In the year 2000, the Drug Abuse and Treatment Act eliminated the federal prohibition of opioid prescribing for the treatment of OUD if the medication was FDA approved specifically for OUD treatment and only if it was a Schedule 3 through 5 substance. It required qualifying physicians, and I want to note that PAs and NPs didn't qualify under the legislation to provide buprenorphine until 2016. They had to apply for and receive a waiver from the federal government to write buprenorphine prescriptions, and they were initially limited to provide prescriptions for 30 patients. In 2002, the FDA approved buprenorphine for OUD treatment, and then finally, we get a bit of a reprieve from some stigmatizing legislation in 2023 
with the Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act, which removed the X waiver so anyone with a current DEA registration and Schedule Three authority can now prescribe buprenorphine. And then we had the Medication Access and Training Expansion Act requiring education for all DEA registrants on OUD and evidence-based treatments. This slide is, is an example of how stigma impacts our laws in Kentucky. The use of buprenorphine is explicitly carved out for OUD and excludes pain, despite the fact that buprenorphine is now more broadly recommended as a preferred agent in the treatment of pain requiring chronic opioids. Restrictions have been placed on the dosing interval, limiting it to once daily, which isn't appropriate for all patients and completely disregards the utility of buprenorphine in managing co-occurring opioid use disorder and pain conditions, such as sickle cell disease, for example. And lastly, the law specifies that buprenorphine can only be prescribed when done with concomitant behavioral modification. While behavioral modification can lead to improved outcomes, the evidence shows that MOUD without behavioral modification can also be beneficial. SAMHSA and other respected bodies recommend that situations be evaluated on an individual basis, but behavioral modification should not be a conditional barrier to treatment, especially as we consider available resources and access. The next few slides I'm going to touch on some interesting legal things that are starting to enter in this arena as well. So the first is that within the last few years, the Department of Justice has officially made statements that patients with opioid use disorder who are not engaging in illicit use, and you know this includes patients taking medication for opioid use disorder, are now covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so it is in fact illegal to discriminate against them based on various factors. And I, I included a few that might be relevant here that we still see quite frequently, right? So if you have a doctor's office or a medical facility that's refusing to admit a patient because they take MOUD solely, um, skilled nursing facilities included, this is illegal. The Legal Action Center has a great uh, template available in terms of providing these facilities with a letter and helping them to understand what their responsibilities are and how they can kind of help remedy the situation. Additionally, if a jail doesn't allow incoming inmates to continue taking their MOUD uh, that's been prescribed before their detention, that is also considered illegal. Another piece of inter interesting litigation that was filed in September of this past year is Landau versus Good Samaritan Hospital. And this case is kind of based on two main things that occurred over several admissions uh, in New York City. The first is that this patient had a few repetitive admissions and in at least two of them, they did not continue his home medication for opioid use disorder during admission, was, which is a very dangerous practice. They also denied this individual home-based IV antibiotic treatment, despite the fact that he had been on MOUD consistently and was doing very well in his treatment. And they're citing violations of the following uh, acts um, and, and le legal legislative um, authority. One of them is New York State specific, but the others are all federal. And another thing that might be interesting is emergency departments have, have also been found to have some legal obligations under some of these acts as well, including the need to screen and offer diagnostic assessment for people who may have opioid use disorder, to provide medication for opioid use disorder, and to facilitate referral when appropriate. And I want to say that nationally, we're not doing a good job of this. I know that there are a lot of uh, places in Kentucky that are working very hard within the emergency departments to kind of turn things around here. But nationally, from the emergency department perspective, buprenorphine prescription rates are exceptionally low. So we're looking at eight and a half percent. I also want to mention the importance of harm reduction. And again, nationally in the emergency department, when people are coming in, they're only writing naloxone prescriptions about 7.4 percent of the time, which is very low. I wanted to provide an analogy just for comparative purposes. If we look at people who come into the ED for anaphylaxis, they're getting epinephrine prescription rates uh, at about 50%. So we really have a lot of work to do here on a national level. I'd like to take a moment to talk about unveiling stigma in opioid use disorder treatment. 
So as we've talked about, opioid use disorder is a disease and we need to focus on it in that context. Relapse rates for people treated for substance use disorders are comparable to those for people treated for high blood pressure and asthma, for example. Relapse is common and similar across these illnesses. Therefore, substance use disorder should be treated like any other chronic illness. Relapse serves as a, a sign to either resume, modify, or institute new treatment. Another way to look at it, would you withhold insulin from a patient with diabetes? Probably not. So consider these parallels to other chronic disease states as you provide context for your care with patients with opioid use disorder. Another misunderstanding is that medications like methadone or buprenorphine, some people might think that they don't work or they're just substituting kind of one addiction for another. And we know that that's just not true. So MOUD stabilizes brain chemistry. It blocks the euphoric effect of opioids. It relieves their physiologic cravings and improves physical and mental health. It also has a whole host of benefits that I've included on this slide. But I really want to hone in on this one of decreasing all cause and overdose related mortality. So let's dig into that a little bit more. I wanted to compare this to other chronic disease states as we did kind of with our relapse rates and look at pharmacotherapy mortality reduction across these disease states with common medications that we use. So starting with opioid use disorder, patients on active MOUD are 82% less likely to die of an overdose, and it decreases their risk of all-cause mortality by about 50%. Let's compare that to hypertension with the use of ACE inhibitors, where we're looking at a reduction of all-cause mortality by about 13%, and cardiovascular deaths by 17%. In asthma, the regular use of inhaled corticosteroids reduces the risk of death by about 60%, so that's a much better number. And then in diabetes, I've included some common drugs that we use here. These reduce mortality risk by about 25, 27%. So I think this truly illustrates how much stigma has infiltrated itself into ultimately our, our treatment decisions. And my hope is that we can start to recognize this as a chronic disease state and practice in a data-driven way. When pe people with opioid use disorder come into the hospital, I've included a few kind of best practices here. When patients are taking MOUD at home, it's best whenever possible to continue that. We should be verifying the dose, so if they're on methadone, calling the opioid treatment programs to confirm and also make, make them aware that that person has been admitted so that, you know, they're not wondering why they're not showing up for, for their doses of methadone. Um, we also shouldn't delay treatment for days when we're waiting for confirmation because I recognize that they're not always open. And generally speaking, if a person comes in and they tell you that they're on methadone once a day, I think it's important to go ahead and get that treatment on board unless there's a significant clinical reason that that's not feasible. With buprenorphine, it's important to look at the prescription drug monitoring program unless the person's getting it from an opioid treatment program, which it will not show in that fashion. You can also evaluate your drug screen data as part of that clinical picture just to ensure that they um, have been adherent to it before they come in and that if you give it to them, you're not going to induce withdrawal if they did have a resumption of use, for example. And then it's also important to engage in that care coordination for continued outpatient follow-up. Again, with their treatment providers, if you can let them know even what types of medications were administered to them in terms of things like benzodiazepines, opioids, and that sort of thing, because they likely will be urine drug tested at some point when they go back to their program. And it's important that they not be penalized for receiving the drugs that they needed during their inpatient stay. When patients are not taking MOUD, it's very important to offer it to them and explain the symptom and mortality benefits. So it is the most effective thing that we really have to treat withdrawal symptoms, but it's also the most effective thing that we have to treat their pain. Because when they come in and we essentially remove right what they've been using, we have a huge deficit that we're trying to overcome and you are not going to adequately treat someone's pain if they're actively in withdrawal. It's also important to coordinate that care, prescribe naloxone and engage in harm reduction strategies. This is not a clinical talk just based on time constraints, but I did wanna just go over a few things with buprenorphine because it's kind of a wonky drug, right? 
So we all have heard that it's a partial agonist with high binding affinity, but what does that really mean? So if we look at the, at the graph here, we have a full agonist kind of on the top where we see more of a linear line all the way from bottom to top. And then we have our partial agonist, which goes about part way here. And so it's important to note that people can overdose on buprenorphine. Primarily, that would be um, opioid naive patients, right? So if um, you or I were, were to receive a dose of buprenorphine and we shot the moon, we could easily overdose on that, especially if we were opioid naive. However, for someone who is, is actively used to being on a large amount of full agonists, then it does have this ceiling effect. And that does also kind of cross over into the realm of respiratory depression. So it's a safer drug than methadone in terms of like comparing head to head with overdose risk. Now let's talk a little bit about how to induce it and then how we can treat pain on top of it and things like that. So if a patient has been actively using full agonist opioids before they come in and they're still kind of living at the top of our graph here, and then we give them buprenorphine kind of too early, then essentially we're bringing them down very abruptly to this partial level, which is still kind of like hitting a concrete wall. And that's where we get this precipitated withdrawal. However, if a person's already experiencing those withdrawal symptoms, it can relieve them. Additionally, for patients who are actively taking buprenorphine for MOUD who have acute pain, we can effectively treat them with full agonists on top uh, to, to utilize those as a strategy for acute pain management. And that is not something that will precipitate withdrawal in that particular case. Briefly, let's touch on acute pain management. So there might be some assumptions that uh, giving people with opioid use disorder full agonist opioids is either illegal or it will worsen their disease and that they might uh, report more pain, engage in drug seeking behavior, right? So they're going to just continuously say that it's not enough because they're just either you know having resumption of use or whatever. And we know that that's just not true and actually not treating someone's acute pain who has an opioid use disorder actually puts them at higher risk of resuming use than if we were to adequately treat them. We know that chronic opioid exposure increases that pain sensitivity pretty, pretty significantly and that they also have a higher opioid tolerance. So our strategies are really to optimize those non-opioid analgesics as medically appropriate. This also includes things like non-pharmacologic therapies as well. And then continuing or initiating their MOUD whenever possible. And then for those you know, episodes of really severe acute pain, we can add those short-acting opioids, uh, anticipating those higher dosage requirements. And lastly, let's think about MOUD prescribing for a minute. So in the hospital, methadone can be given for treatment of opioid use disorder while patients are receiving treatment for their admitting conditions, and buprenorphine can be initiated or continued. However, in the outpatient setting, methadone can't be prescribed by anyone except for an opioid treatment program, so it's really important to coordinate care for people and not kind of leave them hanging without a dose. Buprenorphine, on the other hand, can now be written by any prescriber with an active DEA registration with Schedule Three privileges, again, because of that MAT Act that um, was technically signed into law at the very beginning of 2023. So we've just talked about a lot of really heavy stuff. And I always get this image in my mind of, uh, you know, the commercials that they used to have with Sarah McLaughlin singing the really sad song about the animals and you just feel awful and compelled to do something. And so my goal is that we're not gonna leave you hanging today, right? There are things that we can tangibly do to start making an active impact on this together. And really it starts with the words that we use. So words are important. If you want to care for something, you call it a flower. If you want to kill something, you call it a weed. And I think there's no greater example of this, right, than a dandelion. And it's all about perspective. So I have a seven-year-old son. And when he sees a dandelion in our yard, he gets really excited. And he'll pick it and he'll say, Mommy, I have a flower for you. Isn't it beautiful? And I inherently see something totally different, right? But I think that I'm learning to see it more through his eyes. But I think this analogy was a very powerful one to understand that our words really do matter and they have very different meanings and implications.
one of the best things that we can do to help address stigma is to start using person first language. So this is essentially putting the person before the condition or the behavior rather than defining them by it. So it's medically accurate and current, and this is applicable kind of across the board, right? So instead of saying um, a diabetic, it's a, a person with diabetes, right? So it's not specific to substance use disorder, but in this case, we're talking about that today. And so I think it's important to focus on this. So instead of saying that this person's an addict, if we just shift that language to this person um, has a substance use disorder, that can be very impactful. And then these aren't really just soft skills. I know that I, I hate that terminology, quite honestly. I think that there is plenty of data that shows us that just by changing the language that we use, we actually can make it a more friendly environment for people to actually seek the help that they need and maintain that treatment. So this is really data-driven science. I'd also challenge you to rethink the addiction terminology that again, we're so commonly used to hearing and seeing whether it's media or even within our healthcare systems. So again, instead of saying things like abuser or addict, person with an opioid use disorder, abuse and misuse, Whenever possible, it's really important to avoid, especially the term abuse, because of just all of the negative associations wrapped into that word. If you think of child abuse, domestic abuse, right, there's a lot of negative connotations surrounding that word. So instead of saying those things, we might think about substance use or non-medical use is one of my favorite terms instead of saying misuse. In addition, lapse, relapse, and slip, as we're talking about a person's individual journey, it's better to really say recurrence of symptoms here. Clean and dirty are very dehumanizing and demoralizing terminology. So we shouldn't be referring to people in that context. And then when we're talking about urine drug screen results, it's really more medically accurate to just describe what that test result is. The other ones are how we describe medication for opioid use disorder. So instead of saying like medication-assisted treatment, opioid replacement therapy, et cetera, these really have the connotation that we're changing, you know, switching one drug for another, one addiction for another, or that it's assistive and not necessarily evidence-based treatment. And so it's important to shift our language to, to use terminology like medication for opioid use disorder or addiction medication pharmacotherapy to really show that it is the standard of care and it is very data-driven therapy. And lastly, I threw the word narcotic on here. This one is a legal term that refers to illegal drugs and has a lot of negative connotations. And so it's really best to use the terminology of describing whatever controlled substance it is. So in this case, it would be opioid. Incorporating preferred language into our vocabulary is just one part of the call to action. The second step is to start conversations with your friends, your family, and your colleagues to provide real-time education, broaden your impact, and work to create a culture of respect and accountability to ultimately decrease stigma and improve outcomes of people with opioid use disorder. I have listed some conversation starters that I employ and find helpful to get your creative juices flowing. I'd like to put some of this into practice. So let's review a case. We have BR, who's a 32-year-old man with opioid use disorder and a history of injecting drugs, who was transferred from an outside hospital for stabilization and management of traumatic injuries from a motor vehicle crash. I've included his vitals here, and it's important to note that his pain score at this time is 10 out of 10, and his cows is 15 or moderate op opioid withdrawal. At home, he takes methadone 80 milligrams once daily, and his current relevant inpatient medications are PRN acetaminophen, famotidine, hydromorphone, PRN at 0.5 milligrams Q4, and then oxycodone 5 milligrams Q4 PRN as well. So now we're going to see a narrative of the team discussing BR at table rounds. Provider. Our next patient to discuss is Mr. R, a 32-year-old IV drug abuser involved in a motor vehicle accident and transferred from an outside hospital. His urine drug screen was dirty on admission. He is post-op day two from surgery to address trauma related to the crash. Nursing, how's he been for you today? He's still complaining of a lot of pain, but he's an addict, so I think it's just drug-seeking behavior. 
He's constantly saying that nothing that we give him is helping, even though I'm giving him his pain meds around the clock. So I bet he's just trying to get higher doses. I know he had a big surgery, but he did this to himself. So I think he needs to accept the consequences. Also, he's been asking about his methadone. He says he was getting it every day before coming to the hospital. Are you planning to restart that? Thanks for the update. I'm not sure about the medication assisted treatment. I don't want to stop it abruptly and cause withdrawal, but that's an opioid too. So if we continue it, we're just trading one drug for another, aren't we? He obviously wasn't clean before coming into the hospital since his UDS was dirty on admission, so the methadone isn't even working. Steph, do you have any suggestions to help his pain without narcotics? So I want you to just reflect on this narrative for a moment and try to pull out some of the stigmatizing language that you see, and then we're going to review this together. So I've pulled out the stigmatizing language here in red. So things like IV drug abuser, the fact that his urine drug screen was dirty on admission, he's complaining, he's an addict, drug seeking behavior, medication assisted treatment, and clean in terms of uh, kind of treatment status, and then narcotics. Now I want you to look at this again and make note of some of the stigmatizing assumptions that are held by the team. And then we're going to review this in a minute. So again, we have dirty on admission. And I would say this is absolutely a stigmatizing assumption because this person was transferred from an outside hospital, right? And so we don't know necessarily, this is not descriptive. We don't know what was dirty, right? So what drugs were present there? Did he get them from the outside hospital or in transport? For example, that that discussion about complaining, drug-seeking behavior, he did this to himself. So maybe assumptions that he was actively using when he had his car accident, right? Uh, trading one drug for another wasn't clean in terms of uh, treatment status. And then the methadone isn't working again, um, making assumptions that the person was uh, had resumption of use. And so I'd like to just pie in the sky, right? Let's think about what this conversation and narrative could look like if we just strike the stigma. So again, our provider. Our next patient to discuss is Mr. R, a 32-year-old man with opioid use disorder and history of injection drug use, involved in a motor vehicle accident and transferred from an outside hospital. His urine drug screen was positive for fentanyl and norfentanyl on admission, but we confirm that he received fentanyl for pain control during transport and the patient reports that he is doing well in treatment without symptom recurrence. He is post-op day two from surgery to address trauma related to the crash. Nursing, how's he been for you today? He's still reporting a lot of pain, but his home methadone has not yet been restarted. Can we get that order in right away, please? Thanks for the update. Yes, I will enter the methadone order now and ensure he gets a dose shortly. Steph or pharmacist. Do you know his dose and have any suggestions to help his pain? Yes, I called the clinic this morning and confirmed that he takes 80 milligram once daily. I would suggest optimizing his multimodal therapies. Let's start by scheduling the acetaminophen, adding a scheduled NSAID, and trying a dose of ketamine for analgesia. Can we also increase his immediate release opioid dose to get things under better control acutely, and then we can wean back down as his pain improves after surgery? So again, we covered a lot of ground today, but the things that I really want you to internalize are that opioid use disorder related stigma is pervasive and exceptionally harmful. And it's important for us to support evidence-based treatment and policy. One of the ways that we can just start to change the narrative and the outcomes of our patients is by modeling preferred language and then furthermore starting conversations and beginning to change that culture in real time with our communities and our workplaces as well. I've included some helpful resources slide here that I hope you will find useful. So a few things of, of reference, there is a, a CE course that's very good, um, both by kind of the reset folks and then the NIDA Words Matter as well, which has CME offered. There's a site called the Addictionary that I absolutely love, and it goes through if you're ever not sure about a term or maybe what would be a, a better way to say something, 
This explains kind of the background as to why that might be a stigmatizing term, the, the studies that are associated with that, and then it'll offer preferred language. There's also uh, some great resources from NIDA about prescribing buprenorphine. This specific um, grouping of references is more gauged towards kind of the ED, but I think it really would be applicable in general. And it includes examples and cases and videos for how to, to motivate patients and, and help them to get there. And then if there's any pharmacists on the call, there's um, a great just brief guide from the APHA about our role in reducing stigma surrounding opioid use disorder. And then there's also some helpful resources. I love using these for students, for example. So if you precept, just incorporating this into your curriculum and between that and kind of talking about um, MOUD, making sure that we're um, engaging in patient-centered care, being empathetic and treating them with dignity and respect, and then incorporating these things and kind of debriefing as we go, because all of us at some point are going to interact with patients with opioid use disorder. I think this can be really be a powerful tool to help positively impact the next generation as well. We're going to end with one of my favorite quotes. Do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Does anybody have any questions? And I see that Emily put my, my email in the chat and you are absolutely welcome to reach out to me if you have questions or kind of specific things that you don't feel comfortable airing in front of everyone today. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. And as you said, um, go ahead and unmute your line and ask questions if you want to, or you're welcome to put it in the chat and we'll be sure and have um, Dr. Abel address those questions. Otherwise, um, I will remind you that the webinar, it has been recorded and we'll be placing this on the website uh, for your convenience later. Um, please check the chat box for the website information as well as Stephanie's email and I believe my email is in there as well. So after the webinar, if you have questions, please feel free to um, email Stephanie directly. We'll give you a few more minutes in case someone's typing a question. Well, in the absence of questions in the chat box, I um, will turn over the remainder of the hour. And I want to thank you again, Stephanie, for a wonderful, thorough presentation, very applicable to all of us in healthcare. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Well, we'll say goodbye for now. Thank you.